there's a problem with my video, let me know and I'll work on the sound. So uh, I, I don't exactly have the greatest sound card sitting in my computer. The school teacher gave it to me and that's what I work with. So, uh, But I'll try to improve on things. So thank you. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to cover derivatives. Your final exam will basically be all derivatives. What's the derivative sign? What's the derivative? 3x squared. See, look, you know so many of these already. See, you're, you're in a good position. But what's the derivative of natural log of x? It's actually just 1 over x. It's super easy. You know what the derivative of e to the x is? It's e to the x. The derivative is, is itself. It's really cool. So, um, so we're going to show you some of those things. But today we're going to cover the derivative of inverse functions. Now, some, pe some people may say, well, Mr. Gantz, you're going to chapter 10. Like, you forgot about the rest of 4 and then all 5 and 6. We'll get to four, the rest of four, and then five and six, but chapter seven deals directly with derivatives of these specific functions. And we want to do that while derivatives are fresh in our minds, right? Because we know derivatives well. There's going to be a time where we kind of put derivatives aside when we move on to antiderivatives. So here we go. Let's talk about inverse functions. Do you remember that we found inverse functions last year by taking x and switching it to y? And taking y and switching to x, I'm just trying to, uh, you know, have you understand a little bit about what the heck an inverse function is. We have this y is equal to three x minus two, and uh, we made, uh, we found the inverse. And how did we do that? And then we solved. We had x plus two is equal to three y divided by three. We had one third x plus two thirds is equal to y, right? So that's the inverse function. We also learned that the domain became the range, and that the range became the domain. Okay, good with that? Now, watch the relationship graphically. It's pretty cool. We have 3x minus 2, so I'm going to go down to. And then I have the slope of 3, so I go up 3 and over 1. So that's the graph of my function. Now if I graph the inverse, I'll do that in red. I have a y-intercept of 2 thirds, so it's not quite 1. And then I... Yeah, exactly. So if I go over one, I go up just a third, don't I? Or I could go over three and, and up one, you know, however you want to work it out. But either way, you know, this is the graph that I get, okay? Now let's think about this, okay? The original function had a y-intercept of negative two. So it passed through the coordinate of zero, negative two. So what should the inverse pass through? Yeah, so this spot is negative 2, 0. If the red function has a y-intercept of 2 thirds, then the blue function will have a x-intercept of 2 thirds, right? The x and y switch values. And maybe you remember that graphically, one is the other reflected over the line y equals x. So they have symmetry about the line y equals x. I'm not saying you have to remember all this. I'm just trying to help you understand where inverse functions even came from. And last year we talked about them a little bit, right? We all good? Okay. You remember what the horizontal line, what's the vertical line test to? Yeah, you can determine whether or not it's a function. A horizontal line test tells us whether or not it's a one-to-one -one function. Because it's only when functions are one-to-one -one that we find inverses. So if it's one-to-one, -one, then we can find the inverse. If it's not one-to-one, -one, then the inverse won't be a function. What is one-to-one? One-to-one -one means this. The definition of a function is a relation in which every element of the domain corresponds to exactly one element of the 
range. It's one to one if we add on this part. And every element of the range corresponds exactly to one element of the domain. Okay? And the last thing is this composition. Remember when we did f of g last year? Well, if two things are inverses, then if we compose the inverse together with the original function, you know what we get as a result? f of x is 3x minus 2 in this problem. Agreed? What do we come up with for f inverse? Yeah, 1 over 3x plus 2 thirds. So if I were to compose those together, I would take this and do what with it? Plug it in for x right there. And I would get f of f inverse is equal to 3 times 1 third x plus 2 thirds minus 2. You plug it in for x. So what I get right here? x plus 2 minus 2 is x. Now, if you remember from last year, we didn't just compose them this way, but we composed it f inverse of f as well. We're not going to do that right now, but it turns out that composition is not commutative, so you have to show up both ways. Okay, so it says using the function above, what we want to do today, and this is the big idea, is we want to find the derivative of the inverse function at a value. We want to find the derivative of the inverse function at a value. Let's just show you what it looks like. So we have f of x is equal to 3x minus 2, right? And we have f inverse of x is equal to 1 third x plus 2 thirds. So the first step was to find the inverse. Can somebody tell me what is the derivative of this inverse? 1 third. And if I evaluate the derivative at 4, I get, is there anywhere to plug in the 4? No, it's always 1 third. So we answered that question. The derivative of f inverse at 4. It turns out that there's a really nice way to do this. I can't prove this for you. I'm not smart enough. I'd have to look in the book. And it's not going to be a good use of our time. But let's look at the start. We have a nice formula that says if f is 1 to 1 and differentiable, great, that means it's nicely behaving. And if it's 1 to 1, then it has an inverse, okay? It says uh, g is f inverse and f inverse is g, and it's not equal to 0. Then the inverse function is differentiable at a, and here's the big deal. The derivative of f inverse at point A ends up being a result of this formula. 1 over f prime of f inverse of A. Looks confusing. No big deal. I'm going to make it simple. We have three operations here. We have 1 over, we have f inverse, we have f, f prime. If you were to do order of operations, which one would you do first? Yeah, so f inverse, right? So I'm just going to make a little chart here to help myself out. I'm going to do f inverse. Then after you do f inverse, what would you do next? f prime. Then after you do f prime, you would do 1 over, right? So I always organize my chart that way. And it says, given the following functions, find f inverse prime at point A. So what is my A value here? 6. So I start off by finding f inverse of 6. 
f inverse of 6. If I asked you to find f of 6, what would you do? You plug in 6 because 6 would be an x value. But if I'm doing f inverse, that means 6 is a y value. So 6 equals 3 over x minus 1. Good job. Cross multiply. 3 equals 6x minus 6. Nine is equal to six x, so x is three halves. You good? Everybody okay with that? So I get three halves. So now I take the derivative at what value? Three halves. Well, that means I got to find a derivative. How do you take the derivative of this guy? Chain rule. A lot of you on your test used the bullshit rule for that type of situation, that's fine, but you're more likely to make a mistake. I think it's easier to just do the chain rule. What's the derivative of the inside? One. What's the derivative of the outside? Negative three. It'll be over x minus one squared. So that's the derivative. Can I plug in three halves? What do you get? One half squared? One fourth. Negative 3 over 1 fourth. I put the negative 12 there. Yeah, that's what I did. I plugged the 3 halves into the x. That's it. So the answer is negative 1 fourth. It's f prime of f inverse. Okay. Do we have one minute yet? I think we do, don't we? This one goes quick. Okay, I make the chart. F inverse. F prime. One over. At what spot am I trying to find the inverse? Three. So how do I find the inverse at three? Three equals square root of x plus one. Solve. Nine is x plus one, square both sides. X is eight, everybody good? So the eight goes here. So now I wanna find f prime of eight. Well, I have to find the derivative. What's the derivative root of x plus one? What do I plug in? What do you get? What do I do with that 1 6? What's 1 over 1 6? Done. We'll pick up the last example. We'll take up those five minutes when we get back. All right, so let's end this, folks. Uh, we just got a couple more left. Uh, we all good with that example? So let's set up the structure again. And I, I want to let you know that I mean, you want to hear it straight, right? You don't want me to make stuff up. That's exactly how it is. Anybody who says it differently is lying. Here we go. All right, so I make the chart. F uh, inverse, F prime, one over. All right, trying to find F inverse of what? Negative one. So what do I do? How do I solve that? How do I solve a cubic? Move the 1, okay, 0 equals x cubed plus x minus 2. Ty's got it. Okay, uh, so the only shot that we, we have at solving this is to use our rational roots theorem. So it, it's no big deal, it's super easy. What what are the what are the factors of negative two? We have one and two, and then we got one, so you divide them, right? So your choice are plus or minus one, plus or minus two. Like if there is a rational root, that's what it would be, right? So let's plug in one. Does one work? Yeah. So one's a solution. Yeah, 
yeah, there's, there's, well, in this situation, just find the one. I picked one where there's only one solution. So, okay. Uh, so here's the deal, okay. Um, do you remember when we then took that one and we divided it in? Remember when we did that last year to find the other solutions? So you don't need to find all the others. Just find that one. The others are probably imaginary anyway. Just find the one. Don't worry about two others. That won't ever happen. All right. Good. We've got one. Now what? Well, what's that prime? So what's that prime of one? Four. Now what? Derivative. Oh no, now they give us a table. I want to find f inverse prime of 6. Well, I make the table. And you don't have to, I just think this is the easiest way to organize your work. And again, this is what somebody taught me. I just, this is what I decided to do. You got something else? Go ahead. Inverse y. F inverse of what? 6. So is 6 an x value or y value? So am I am I looking at row, row number 1, 2, or 3? Looking at row 2. So I'm looking at this entry, right? So what would x be? 3. So now I'm going to do f prime of 3. It says f prime of 3 is negative 2. That is most likely the type of question you would get on the AP exam, where they give you a table. One more. We're trying to find f inverse prime of 4. So I got f inverse, f prime, and 1 over. What's f inverse? So yeah, where is it equal to 4? At 4. F prime of 4. What do you think? That's it.